brilliant, kind, and I would say fun person as well, whom I know for many years. I gotta say that I've met Pedro before I had hair and beard. So it's been a long time that we know each other. Pedro has uh, had many hats in his life. No, he was the president of his university, uh, grantee for the Wellcome Trust, top researcher across the globe, one of, one of the most cited researchers in the globe. And to me, the most, uh, I think the most anecdotal thing that I can share about Pedro is I met him for the first time in a conference. I'm not gonna say when, because I don't want you to guess our ages. And I saw this very young guy asking tough questions for the top scientists in the room. And I asked myself, who is this guy? How he has the balls to ask those questions. And now he's doing the same thing with Bolsonaro and in the Brazilian con Congress, you know, in, in, in inquires and being sort of you know, in the forefront of you no. Know, championing science uh, to promote health uh, in Brazil and the globe. So without further ado, I want to introduce you, Pedro Alau, our invited speaker today. So thank you very much, guys. It is my pleasure to be here. You know, when, when we go give these talks, most times you see those types of logos. So that logo is from Fulbright. I'm here in the US to a Fulbright scholarship so I'm working as a visiting professor at UCSD in San Diego. And you would typically have my university, my Brazilian university logo or the Brown School logo, all these ones. But that one you probably never saw, the one on the top left. So that logo is the logo of the Senate in Brazil. And the reason why you have this here is that I gave this talk to the Senate members in Brazil because there was, there's a commission that produced a report on the mishandling of the pandemic of COVID-19 in Brazil. And I was one of the scientists invited to comment about how Brazil has dealt with COVID-19 and obviously how bad Brazil has dealt with COVID-19. So the title of this talk, and I will go to this side, so the title of this talk is The Challenge of Conducting Epidemiological Research in Times of Pandemic and Denialism. Before I say anything else, let me just say that I'm a researcher in the field of physical activity and health. I do pretty much the same things as Deborah does. She does it better than I do, but it's the same field. So I do the, th the same things that Rodrigo does. So my background is in physical activity and health and as a Brazilian researcher, I thought, you know, I need to do something on COVID-19 because this thing is devastating my country. So that's why I will be talking about COVID. I do not understand the mechanisms and, you know, I do not understand the virus. I would not be able to develop a vaccine. What I can do is to produce population-based studies on COVID-19 because I've done that for other health issues. So in this title is exactly the same of an article we published in the International Journal of Epidemiology. So if you want to go read in detail the things that I will describe here, there is this article in the International Journal of Epidemiology that we submitted when we were celebrating our first anniversary. So we thought, you know, this project has been widely known in Brazil. So pretty much I would guess that if we do a survey in Brazil and say EpiCovid, probably 80% of the population knows what we are talking about. So it's massive for a research project to be known by the population. So we decided we should celebrate our first year on an article, you know, reflecting on what has happened over time. So in this talk, what I will do is that I will divide this into three parts. The first one is very short but most of you are graduate students in masters or PhD students. And there are some methodological issues that needs to be considered. The, way, the level of detail I will explain here is not the level of detail you need because you are pretty much more advanced than the Senate members in Brazil were. So I'm sorry for that, it's kind of basic, but some of the things need to be said. 
Then I will present a little bit about the EpiCovid project. And then I will go to the part where I compare Brazil with the rest of the world. Pretty much the goal here is to answer the question, was it ine inevitable or not? Because, you know, if COVID would produce the same damage, regardless of what our government would be doing, it's not their fault, you know. But if it is producing more damage in Brazil than it should, then we should look like, and our government is one of the reasons. And I will explain. So, one of the things that needs to be said about COVID is that if you are doing a study here in St. Louis or in Pelotas, where I live in the south of Brazil or anywhere else, you can do a study and use the number of cases depending on the level of, or, you know, on the level of detail you have on the information. But if you do any state, city, city, state, or international comparisons, you, know, you need to use deaths and not cases. So that's very important because the number of cases, uh, COVID cases is a huge underestimate everywhere you look. The official statistics always have numbers that are lower than real numbers because not everyone gets tested, because testing policies vary from country to country. And for those who have an epidemiological background, so you have the bias, and the main reason is that the degree of error is not the same across countries. So that's a big issue. So if you go to South Korea, testing is, is huge. So probably the, the number of, of cases in the official statistics is close to the reality. In other countries where testing is very low, the number is a severe underestimate. So do not use cases, use that. For the exact same reason, you should not use case fatality because case fatality uses the number of cases as the denominator. So why do I need to say that here? Because when I was talking to Senate members, they would get the information on WhatsApp and they would share anything. And some of the information they would get would be on these variables that do not mean anything. But they, they didn't know, so they would share. So I had to say. And the third one is the most ridiculous thing, but I need to say in Brazil now, the main source of science information is Watson, by far. So realistically, if I look at my family group from day one of the pandemic until today, I have a group with my family that's very typical in Brazil. We have WhatsApp groups with family friends. Within these 18 months, let's say, I got things like, you can die if you use the mask too often because you get intoxicated. Uh, more recently, our president said that if you take the vaccine, you can, you can be infected with HIV. He said, let me go back to that. If you take the COVID vaccine, you will develop HIV. It was banned from YouTube, it was banned from social media, all other media. But he said that, and obviously that went to my WhatsApp because people shared it. So I will not say all the examples because they are absolutely amazing. Uh, but the fourth thing I want to say here in terms of methodology is a very important one which is a lesson that we learn in epidemiology 101. And sometimes we forget about, it, which is in our field, the denominator is really. So for example, oh, the US is the country with the highest mortality in the world. It's not true. Although the mortality due to COVID is really high here, it's only the highest in absolute numbers. When you do relative numbers, which is what you should do, the US, I think it's top 20 or top 30, but it's not the one, the country with the highest mortality in the world. The country with the highest mortality in the world is Peru in Latin America. So just to give you an overview. And why did I say these things? Because 
when I go to the media, and this is Brazilian media, so you don't need to, to read this. Thing. I go and remind myself of a paper my supervisor published in the Lancet in the 80s, which is what's the denominator? Which is, you know, when a politician will go to TV to the TV and say, you know, the US is the country that vaccinates most people around the world. Yeah, the US is one of the largest countries around the world. In the end, the country, which will be the country with more vaccines around the world? It will be China, doesn't it? In absolute numbers, because it's where more, most people live. So it's important to consider relative numbers. And the other thing that bothers me a lot in COVID is this thing. That, you know, this movement against science that we have in Brazil, but we have here in the US as well, one of the things they say is no matter what you do, the shape of the cure will be the same, which is true. If you look at the data from South Korea and from Portugal, the shape of the cure is the same, but you guys are rather stupid. What's the I don't know if the teachers here, but you guys should give a point to those. Guys. So, problem here is it really the same? You are not doing these in-person things anymore, so we don't we don't remember that we need to interact with the person speaking. What is the difference between these two countries? Come on, absolutely. Look at that. The, the shape is the same, but in South Korea, mortality is 0 0.4 for every 1 million people in the worst, worst time. In Portugal, it's 25. So 0 0.4, 25. It's a huge difference, but the shape of the curve is the same. So if a politician will, will go and get this information from what they will do is that they will share these two graphs and say, look, I told you lockdowns do not work. This place has done, it's not only lockdowns, but they have done testing, all these things that you guys say that you need to do. And look, the, the shape of the curve is exactly the same as the other country, which did not do any of that. So be careful, interpret the data, which is what we know how to do. So then I will tell a little bit of a story about how this epicovid study uh, happened and then i will need to go back so in 1981 so let me just provide you some context i was born in 1980 so i have nothing to do with the study they did at that time i was just a baby but some colleagues of mine who actually are co-authors or co-investigators in the epicovid project they decided to run a study in my city in the south of Brazil because they had the feeling that infant mortality data in official statistics was underestimated. So they had the feeling, you know, look, one of them is a pediatrician, the other one does maternal and child health research. You know, we, we have information about many kids dying in the first year of life but when we look at the official statistics, the numbers are so low. So maybe there's something wrong. So in 1982, they did a study to evaluate what the real infant mortality rate was in Pelotas, Brazil. And obviously they found that infant mortality was higher than it would show in the official statistics. So that's why they did the study. But what came next was this book which you don't need to speak Portuguese to understand the title, which is uh, Epidemiology of Inequalities. Because what they did find in 1982, so several of you were not born at that time. Rodrigo was already, you know, probably middle-aged or something like that. Uh, but what they found that was more interesting was that among the 20% poorest families in Brazil in 1982, infant mortality was as high as some of the African countries that had the highest infant mortality in the world. And within the same city, 
in the south of Brazil, the infant mortality among the 20% richest families was similar to some Scandinavian countries that had the lowest infant mortality figures in the world. So, you know, they went there to do a study about, you know, underestimate of infant mortality, but what data, you know, showed really was inequalities all around. And then you understand what, why I'm mentioning these things. Because then, 40 years afterwards, COVID arrived in Brazil, and we developed a study exactly with the same goal. And this is why the logo is like this thing that should be, oh yeah, that should be a nice goal. I don't know if you can recognize that. It tries to be an iceberg. The idea was to combine an iceberg with the virus. And and this one will never there. So if, if you don't like that, it's a problem for our marketing. But anyway, so the study was designed for the same thing. So we decided to run this study because we thought official statistics on COVID-19 were an underestimate. And they were. So we, we showed that in, with real data. But realistically, the main thing that the data showed us was inequalities again 40 years after that original study so when we look at the data on covid in brazil people tend to say oh covid is democratic it's universal yeah i don't know what you mean but there are certain groups of the population that are much more likely to get infected and i will show you why which group so this is what we have and this graph is just to show you that between early last year and now, and now we have one more data point around here. So we completed 11 rounds of data collection in my home state. So my state is uh, the, in the south of Brazil, 11 million people live in that state. And we have completed eight uh, 11 rounds of data collection. In each of these rounds, we interview and test a population-based sample in nine cities. In total, it's 4,500 people in each round. So in total, it's 50,000 people tested through these. And when we started, so this is the first survey, the prevalence was 0 0.05, which means we tested 4,500 people and we got two positive tests. We thought the test was wrong with that. But then when we expanded this study to the whole country, in the north region of the country, there were cities in which of every five tests, you got one positive. So the test was working. It's just the pandemic had not started in my state at that time. And it was very low for several months. And until October, only 5% of the population of that state had been infected. And then, unfortunately, it went like this. And the last data point is around 20, around close to 25%. So pretty much, we have a sense on what proportion of the state population had been exposed to the virus at each time point. This is an antibody test. So it's not only active infections, it's prior infections as well. And nowadays, it doesn't make much sense to continue doing that because now we have people with antibodies due to the vaccine or due to prior infection. So it's difficult to do in terms of these things. But, and now it's where the complicated story starts. So because we were running that survey at the state level, the Brazilian Ministry of Health approached us and said, look, do you want to do the same for the entire country? And then I need to disclaim this. So at that time, the president was the same that is today. So although the president was the same, we said yes. So it is important to our country to know the reality. In terms of COVID, I, don't, I do not like the guy it, it is our job as you know, public workers 
to go and do what we know how to do. So we are accepted to do this work. So this slide is a combination of methods and results. So those are the 133 cities that were included in the national survey. They are spread all over the country. The size of the node represents the prevalence of, co of infection in each time point. So as you can see, very early on, the pandemic in Brazil was concentrated here in the North region only, pretty much. The prevalence was below 1% in all these cities. In the second survey, which was, so this is May last year. This is June, early June. You could see that it was growing and moving towards the Northeast. In the third survey, it was pretty much the same. This is the end of June. So it's only two weeks difference between these two. It is there. So the pandemic was concentrated in the region of the country. And then in big cities, for example, here, Rio de Janeiro, for obvious reasons, because of tourism, all these things. So this is the type of information we were producing at that time. We produced very cool results for the scientific community as well. And this slide, I don't want you to follow the slide in detail, but the story behind here is that EpiCovid was on one of the first studies in the world to show how important this specific symptom is for COVID, loss of smell or taste. I don't know uh, how many of you guys had COVID, but this is the most specific symptom to be seen. So in, in EpiCovid, six out of every 10 people infected presented with this symptom. So it is a very specific one. And EpiCovid was one of the first studies to show that. So you stop being able to feel the taste of things. Or, or sometimes you do not stop feeling the taste, but you have an alteration of, you know, you, you smell coffee and it's not exactly the same as it, it would be normally. The other thing that the EpiCovid project did very early on was to show that kids have the same likelihood of being infected as the other age groups. But this is very descriptive, but you know, this is round one, May, early June, late June. So in each of these surveys, pretty much, if you look carefully, there's no clear trend. So kids also are infected with this virus. At that time, there were doubts about it. You know, some people would claim that kids would not get infected and they would not transmit the disease, which is not true. Obviously they have, their cases tend to be milder, which is good, but they do infect other people. So this is shown here. But the main problems arose when we started to see things like this. So Q1 here is the 20% poorest families in Brazil, and Q5 is the 20% richest families in Brazil. So COVID, let, let's go back. So COVID arrived in Brazil as it arrived in most countries through rich people flying to the country. So, but as soon as the community transmission started in Brazil, we started finding this which is pretty much what we find for many other diseases and you guys know. So obviously there are no biological or genetic explanations for the fact that poor people are more likely to get infected. It's obviously social and cultural. Poor people live in smaller houses with more people, so more crowding. They have less or fewer access to the internet and they need to leave the household to get you know, money to the family. So poor families were much more likely to have people infected. And this result was one, but this one was a complicated. And this one caused many things that you, you hear in the next minutes. So we found that indigenous populations had much higher contamination rates as compared to white populations in Brazil. And it was also true for 
black populations, which are yellow here in this graph, I did not use the correct colors. You know, pretty much all minority groups as compared to white populations had much higher infection. And again, there is no genetic or biological explanation for these groups who have higher infection rates. What it does mean is that there's a social explanation for it. And this result was not received well by the Ministry of Health. So the same Ministry of Health, which employed us to do this study, they did not like to see this result, uh, you know, showing up. Just to give you a little bit of context, at that time, there was, you know, debate in the media and everywhere in the Congress about you know, deforestation in the Amazon region, which is particularly problematic for indigenous population. There was discussion about land. How do you say the Marcação de Terras? Yeah. So these topics were really problematic at that time. And then it was one more thing to show that our country was not protected from indigenous population. They did not like that. And what they did, they had this fantastic idea of censorship, which is something that we most times hear about, but we don't think it does happen in Brazil in, the, in 2020, but it does. So let me say what happened. As the principal investigator of the study, I was doing the press conference of the study results, and we had arranged it to happen inside the presidential palace in Brazil, it is in the country's capital. The Ministry of Health would be there. I was there, you know, it was like, and we would present these results to the media of the entire country and to the population through the media. So obviously we practiced, we discussed everything and I sent them these slides. And when I arrived at the presidential palace, it was kind of 15 minutes before the talk would start. Let's press pause on that. So 15 minutes before our talk would start, I was talking to Lou, I was just, you know, it's 15 minutes before the talk. In that day, I was informed 15 minutes prior to start my talk that one of my slides had been removed from my presentation. That's pretty much and you can imagine it was this. So they excluded this slide from my presentation and they said, I should not comment about this result yet. You know, I gave a call to the other authors of the uh, investigators. We decided, we, we thought about canceling the press conference, but we said, no, let's, the population needs to know these results as, you know, the entire thing. So let's present the overall results I will comment on these results, even without this slide. And the next day, let's put the word out about it, spread the word. The next day it was in the main television channel in Brazil, a specific thing about that. And there was, I don't think, I don't remember whether it was a cover page or at least a big thing in the New York Times about the specific result. So obviously it backfired, you know, they tried to censor it and we, because of that, we said, no, no, no. If you don't want that to go, it's because it should go on. So, and, and after that, the other thing that happened is that they decided to stop funding this study. And funny story about this is that I was informed by a journalist of that. So I received a call from a journalist and she said, can you comment on the, decision of the Ministry of Health to stop funding your study. And I said, I cannot because I don't know that. You were just telling me. And then she was like, oh no, just to let you know, the minister just said that in a press conference. And I said, yeah, you can imagine the reason. So they decided to stop funding the study. And then I just, I just showed this slide just to be a, li a little bit self-promotion here. They did a systematic review on serological studies on COVID-19 some months ago, they included like 500 studies all, all around the world. And EpiCovid was one of the eight, I think, 
studies that received the highest grade in terms of methodological items. So all items, we received the highest grade possible. So I think it was not for scientific reasons that they decided to stop running these. You can imagine that. So then I will stop here and I will go to the next thing, which is completely different. So this last, let me see what time here. So yeah, the next 15 to 20 minutes, and then I will be done because I'm speaking too, too much. So I will talk about what has happened in Brazil that you know explains how bad our data are in terms of code. And we call it the several, seven capital sins. So you learn in public health very early on that if you have an infectious disease, the first thing you need to do is this. The way you control an infectious disease is testing, contact tracing, and then isolating suspicious. That's what you do. And we, we did not learn that with COVID. We learned that many decades, I would say centuries ago. We did not do that in Brazil. The other thing, if you want your population to do things, there are many discussions on that, but it is obvious that in Brazil, if you have the president and then Neymar, the famous soccer player, and Anita, the singer, and if all famous Brazilians were saying the same things, the population would be more likely to accept. The problem in Brazil is that many people were saying these things and the president was saying the opposite all the time. So we did not have a unified communication strategy. The other mistake we had, and this is important for you guys because it's what you do in your life. Brazil, even people with good intentions, but Brazil adopted a clinical approach to the pandemic instead of an epidemiological approach. What I mean here is that some business people, again, who had very good intentions, they put all their money at buying, purchasing respirators, oxygen. And you never stop a pandemic just providing care to those infected. You only stop a pandemic if you stop the transmission. This is what we learned again, centuries ago. So I think that there was this misconception here. Our president was responsible for some anti-masks campaigns. We never had a crisis committee, but these are the two that I will highlight the most. So the first one is this promotion of ineffective treatments. I don't know if you guys who are from other countries heard about it, but I hear about two medicines all the time, chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine and ivermectin. Have you heard about that? You guys, the ones from other countries. Oh, yeah, you, you, you have. That's interesting. So Brazil is doing well at disseminating to the international audience things that do not make any sense. So in Brazil, there was the president during the entire period of the pandemic, he's letting people know, don't, don't, don't panic. You can expose yourself to the virus because if you are infected, these two drugs will save you. And he's saying that every single day. And people are listening to him, some of them, and many of them are not here anymore to, to tell him because they died. You know, I think that Brazil is the one country in the world, and that's very specific to Brazil. I know that the US has experienced some, some of the things the same as in Brazil, but this is specific when Brazil is the world champion. There's no other country in the world doing so much with this drug than in, that Brazil is, and it doesn't make any sense. And the other one was that Brazil had the option to purchase vaccines early on. There are 101 unanswered emails from Pfizer to the Brazilian government trying to sell the vaccine. So there are very many good jokes about this in Brazil. I would just say that what I want for, I don't want that really because I have my life and things like that, but what you want as a grow of a relationship in your life 
is to have someone to invest on the group as much as time as the They sent 101 emails. Brazil never replied, and they still sold the vaccine to us later on. So it's, you know, it's like the, is it rose in two and a half men, something like that, if you ever watch that thing. So she insisted so for so, so long that in the end, she was with the guy. So that's un unbelievable. Uh, and the other thing is that this, all these anti-vax campaigns are going on in Brazil, but here at the same they did not work. So all the other work, I mean, in the wrong sense. They worked to play in favor of the virus, except of the vaccine. The Brazilian population is so used to vaccines that even when the discourses were trying to say that the vaccines were not safe, even that the vaccine would make you have HIV, it didn't work at 95% of the Brazilian population wants to take the vaccine. And many of them, over, I think 75% of them are now fully vaccinated. So this is the one, probably the one battle that we won in this entire thing was the vaccine. So, Going to the last part of the talk, this is one statistic that I like a lot because it's so simple that my grandmother will understand easily. So Brazil has 2.7% of the world's population and Brazil has 12.9% of the world's COVID deaths. I don't know how to explain it. I have tried, but I, I have no idea. So why? If I would think about the history of public health in Brazil, Brazil would have an average mortality that would be lower than the world's average, not five times higher. So if Brazil has a mortality that's five times higher than the global average, something is going really odd or something like that. So, and then, so, this is a specific thing that I want to show you just to give you some context of what we epidemiologists can do at this time. So I was interviewed by one of the newspapers in Brazil and they prompted me to do this calculation and I did. And afterward, this other guy did it in a much better way and they produced a paper on it. So the idea here was to, to test if Brazil had purchased the vaccines when it was first offered by Pfizer and CoronaVac, how many deaths would be would have been prevented? Or virtually? And it is a in between 100,000 and 150,000. It's a lot. Only by replying, imagine our emails, most of them are so boring. If replying to one email would have said all these things, if Brazil would say, yes, we want the vaccine, start producing for Brazil. So it's huge. If you imagine many, many people in our families and our friends who died in April this year because they, they had no time to take the vaccine, it's kind of frustrating. You know, the vaccine was available, the vaccine could be there. So I don't want you to, to I need to say here that in some countries, the situation in terms of vaccines is much worse than in Brazil. It is true. But you know, Brazil had the opportunity at that time and did not use it. But this is the part that I like the most. So this is COVID cumulative mortality worldwide, excluding Brazil in blue and in Brazil specifically in green. And this is kind of disturbing. So if you take any, you know, a million people that live in planet Earth, around 550 died due to COVID. That's the global average. And of any group of 1 million, 550 died. In Brazil, it is 2,800. So it's 5.1 times higher. So this is real data. But then I love when the denialists, we would we use in Portuguese the word negacionistas, which are you know those who defend the things that do not make any sense. 
So when I present this, they love to criticize and they start criticizing. This is not how you do this comparison. And then I love it because it is true. There are other factors that we might consider. So the first one is age structure. COVID mortality is obviously concentrated in the oldest age groups, but the Brazilian population is not older than the global average. It's actually young. So if you take, if you adjust for the age structure of the population, this difference gets wider. So, you know, their argument that our calculation is wrong could be true, but it's wrong in the wrong direction. So it would be even worse. The other thing that they say, oh, but you cannot compare, compare Brazil with these tiny countries with very sm small populations. So then we did this. So these are the 10 most populous countries around the world. We have Brazil. Then we have the other three, which are, because Russia is in a bad period right now. So Russia is getting there. So then we have the US, Mexico, sorry for that, Deborah, and Russia. They are more or less at the same place. But then we have six countries, which are among the top 10 populous countries in the world with very low COVID mortality. So it is not because Brazil is populous that we have these mortalities. Let's try to find another explanation. The next one they used to, to like is, oh, but the level of development should be taken into account. Yeah, that's the BRICS. So there's this group of five countries, Brazil, South Africa, uh, Russia, India, China, and again, Brazil, this, look, this looks like soccer some years ago. Regardless of the statistic you do, Brazil would be the best in the world. Unfortunately, it's not the case anymore, but it was like that at some point. So no matter the way you look at these data, it's always the same story. So there's no other variable to explain the than scientific denialism. And this is a very methodological thing, which I love. And I hope this paper will be accepted because I will tell you this story. In, the, in epidemiology, you probably learned, or you will learn, that correlation is not the same as causation. And in 1965, Bradford Hill published this paper showing nine criteria that should be used to test whether an observed association was causal or not. So just to, to give context, just to give you context on it, if you take a very well-established association, let's say smoking and lung cancer, it fits eight out of nine. If you take our field, physical activity and coronary heart disease, it fits eight or seven or eight out of nine. So what we decided to do was to test the association between scientific denialism and COVID mortality against each of these nine criteria. And every time you do that, the most difficult criteria to show is specificity. Because if you look at smoking, for example, it's not specific to lung cancer. Smoking will cause other diseases and activity the same. So we decided there was a way we could test this association for specificity. And obviously all the others are met. So we tested for this last one, and this is the result. So I, I want you to, to pay attention on this. This is cool. So that left-hand side. So here you have the share of votes for Bolsonaro, our president in the second round of the last election. So we can do it in 10 groups or in five groups. It fits better the model to do it in five, but the result is absolutely the same in 10. So in the, in, the, in the cities which voted, less than 20% 20, 20 of the population voted for Bolsonaro, the mortality is 136 per million. Then it goes up. In the cities that voted 60% or more for Bolsonaro, the mortality is 300 and some. This is the type of association that 
is very likely to be just correlation. When you find an association like that, the first thing you, oh, there is something else going on. So, you know, this, these cities are richest or, you know, there is another explanation. So what we decided to do was to test the same thing, but the outcome variable would be overall mortality, excluding COVID-19, so all other factors. And then you get the flat line that you would expect. So the association between voting for Bolsonaro and disease is specific for the one disease in which he says all the things that he says. Like, you know, if you get vaccinated, you develop AIDS, or if you use the mask too much, you die, or just take chloroquine and you'll be fine. So this, is, this association is specific to scientific denialism and COVID mortality and doesn't happen for other types of deaths. So we, we decided this paper obviously could go to the high impact journals in the world. You know, some journals like The Lancet would love to publish it. But what we decided to do here, and I don't know whether it's a good idea or not, we contacted the editor of this journal. So we decided to submit the paper for the same journal in which Bradford Hill published his original causation criteria in 1965, which is like, I think the name is now the Proceedings of the Royal Society of Medicine in Britain. It is still good. It's the impact factor is around five, I think, or six. But we thought this is the, the place where we want to publish this paper. So it's under review now. I hope they will like it. So in summary, because I do want to interact and to get questions. So Brazil, regardless of how we look, is one of the worst countries in the world in the response to this thing. And there is no other explanation to that other than the nihilism. One of the, pro oh, I continue with the typo there. It's not hard, it's hurt. I don't know why that A is there. So aiming herd immunity, which was one of the things that we did was the wrong strategy at, at first, and then it became unacceptable because other countries started by trying to achieve herd immunity, Sweden, UK, but as soon as they realized it was wrong, they moved and they changed the strategy and Brazil not, never changed. And obviously many things we did should be allowed. So this is pretty much what I had. Thank you very much. And I'm happy to take questions. I'll have moderating questions. And we have one question in Zoom already, and that's coming from Ross. And I uh, hope you are ready to ask your questions too. Ross is asking, what's your advice for graduate students, students on how to better use science to inform? I have to read that again. Sorry, Ben. Soon to be graduates of our programs on how best to communicate science to policymakers in a time of crisis. So I, I think there are two things here. The first one is the, uh, the entire communication thing. Uh, we as scientists doing research on COVID, we went through a natural experiment of exposure to the media that we never had in our lives. So I speak to the Brazilian media on average twice a day for the last 500 days. So, which it is an experiment on what you should say that will cause an impact. Because if you use too, te too technical wording, people will not understand anything of what I say. So I think the first thing is to work much more than we do in communication of science and you know, science communication and all these fields, translational research and things like that. That's one part of it. The second part of it for us that I want to share with you guys is the, my feeling is that when we go teach now 
methodology or science methodology, methods, epi methods and things like that, we tend to take for granted what should be the first three to four weeks of any of these courses. So we tend to start by teaching research methods and research designs and things like that. But because of the way society is organized now, social media and things like that, we need to spend at least a month talking to students at the undergraduate and at the graduate level about some basic science assumptions. You know, that you will start with questions, not with answers, that consistency is important. You have no idea how many times I get a WhatsApp message. Look, there is a study showing that lockdowns do not work which is possibly true, but there are other 300 studies showing that lockdown work. So, you know, but we need to teach the, commu the community and that goes through undergraduate and graduate students, these basic principles of science that we forgot because we, we take them for granted and we go to the next step straight away. So particularly this idea that science starts with questions and that for scientists, questions are at least as important as answers. We need to go back and explain that to people. So I think that's one thing. And the last thing, Ross, uh, that I want to share is that we should never be silent. In situations like the one we are facing in Brazil and the one you guys faced here in the US, silence is an option. And it's an unacceptable option. So the idea that I will be silent and that will be a neutral position is not true. So when you have days like the ones we are facing, the first thing you need to say is to stand up and let people know what's really going on. So I would answer with these three things. I hope that was sufficient. And I want to meet Ross in person. He needs to know that. Hi. Um, thank you for speaking today. It's always interesting to see the international aspect of public health and how different countries deal with public health in general. Um, but at the beginning of your speech, so I have a large family from India, and we also have a WhatsApp group, and a lot of things are shared through the WhatsApp group, and so I can uh, relate to that. But um, just as a public health professional, how do you think about um, having other public health professionals that are um, formally trained in handling like false public health information that's given through social media because it seems to be a growing um, avenue for sharing public health information. That goes back. So thank you very much. That's very good to know. In the Indian perspective, it's always good to have the perspective from India because you know it's a huge part of the world's population. Uh, the first thing that I would say is that we need to be extra careful on what you just described on a specific thing. You know, discrepan discrepancy and disagreement are, you know, basic principles of science. We could, we can, and we, we must continue to disagree. That's how science moves on, which doesn't mean what's happening nowadays. So, we can, let me just give you one example. In our field of physical activity, a, a key question has always been, when I de deliver an intervention, should I focus on people or on places? So is it better to invest on people, you know, try to let them know how physical activity is important, or should I go and bypass them and invest on places like building psychopaths, and that will make them be more active? That is a fundamental question that is absolutely valid in science. So these things, this type of disagreements between public health professionals would be fine because they are the essence of, of science. But when you have 50 studies showing that chloroquine does not work for COVID and you continue to say it works, then it's not science. And that needs to be 
treated. I would at least say that should be exposed and sometimes it should be criminalized even because there is a threshold that some guys are crossing and I think we need to, to say, you know, it is fine. And, and this is something that I used to say, it is fine that in March last year, someone thought, you know, this drug that we used for malaria can have an effect, a positive effect on COVID, let's test it. But after you test it and you have the results showing that it doesn't work, then if you continue to promote that, that's crime. So I think, I think we need to be crystal clear on where the line is drawn, but the line needs to be drawn. And I have to say that I'm always, if, if it is, this is a battle between blue and red in the US, you're, you're used to that. I, I have been criticized one of the sides most of the time in my talk, but on this specific thing, I will criticize the other side too. I think people are getting confused about what is the normal scientific disagreement that you can have and what is negationism or denialism. One good topic to discuss on this is closure of schools. The literature on school closure is not that consistent. And if I go and say that everyone claiming that schools should be reopened is a negationist or denialist, this is wrong from my side. It is not. There is debate in the literature how effective it is to close schools, particularly when the trend is not like this. Because when it's like this, you need to close everything, including schools. But most times, other than that, the schools should be open. There are lots of reasons for that. So this is what I mean. There is a line that needs to be drawn and the line should not be everything that I say is science, everything that they say is not science. That's not true. But in some cases, it's not science, it's crime. And for example, when our president said, if you get the shot, the vaccine, you can, you can be infected with HIV. This is not science. This is not a science discussion. This is a crime discussion and he needs to be responsible for what he said. I think this is you know, a wonderful conversation. I could go on for another hour of questions. We have a few comments in the, in the Zoom chats and one of them from Anna Bauman, who is a fellow Brazilian and a good friend. She's thanking you for you know, fighting the good battle and she's no cute. She's no really you no know, congratulating to stay strong in, in, in tough times. And, yeah, Almost Pedro, Pedro hasn't there. shared that, but he has you no know, had death threats. You no, know, his wife was followed in the city. So it's it's he's only showing sort of the surface of the the, ug the ugliness that he had faced, and you know also he hasn't shared what's the secret to be one of the most influential researchers in the globe before you reach forty years old. So maybe I'm that's forty one. That's you are absolutely wrong. more influential before you're 40. So I think that's another topic for another talk, maybe. So thank you, Pedro, for coming to St. Louis to join us at Brown School. You know, we congratulate you. Thank you for, for being here. Thank you for everybody that attended this talk today. And I hope our next speaker series will be you know, with more, sort of a bigger audience in person and hopefully you know, more relaxed even so. So I thank you, uh, you all for coming today. And I'll see you in the next speaker series next year, because this was the last one for this season. So thank it was you all. the first and the last. Yeah. <laughs> thank you all. Have a wonderful day, you all. Thank you. Thank you.